Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Today's Reformation Sunday here at the Church of the Covenant. It's, it's a big Sunday for us Lutherans and we Presbyterians. It's a day that we remember um, two Protestant reformers are in particular. Uh, for our Lutherans, we remember Martin Luther, who in 1517 posted the five, the 97 theses upon the castle of Lord Wittenberg, forever sparking the Protestant Reformation. Also during this time period of the 1500s, there was a man named John Calvin, and he was also a Protestant reformer um, who helped spark what became known as the Reformed Church, which our Presbyterian Church belongs to as well. This morning, I want to make a case for you by first looking at these reformers and what they did 500 years ago, and compare them to what David did 3,000 years ago as he faced Goliath. I think they share a lot of commonalities. In fact, I want to make a case for you that David was actually a Protestant. The way he followed God, the way he trusted God, the way he put his hope and his faith in God above anything and everything else is something that we Protestants pride ourselves in. Now, the Protestant Reformation, what makes a Protestant different than any other Catholic? Well, the Protestant Reformation all came down really to a number of different things, but if you're going to just boil it down to one issue, it comes down to how are we saved? How are we made right with God. When we take our last breath here on earth, how can we be assured that we will see God's eternal life standing before us, welcoming us into God's eternal kingdom? Well, before Martin Luther and John Calvin, the standing notion was that people are saved essentially through a number of good works. It's almost like you can picture the scale, two sides of the scale. In the 1500s, if you had more good things that you've done in your life compared to the bad things done in your life, you probably should expect to get into heaven. But Martin Luther and John Calvin were, were biblical scholars. They knew their Bible, and they knew that what the entire church, the Catholic church, every single church here on earth in the 1500s was teaching at that time wasn't true. They were looking through God's word, and they could find no place in Scripture that taught that somehow we are made right with God by the things that we do. But Luther and Calvin will teach us, and the reason we celebrate them today is they teach us we are only made right with God through faith. That it comes down to complete and utter dependence upon God. Now, some will say we Protestants have, have made it easier to earn our way into heaven. That somehow, if we take any type of doing good things out of the equation, when it comes to, to making ourselves right with God, that we've cheapened it in some aspects. And I would argue that that's not the case at all. It is very, very, very hard to put one's total and complete trust in God. It's easy to say it. It's even easy to come to church on Sunday, but this morning I want you to examine your soul. Do you fully trust God? If you are presented with a life or death situation, or if God was truly looking into your soul, do you fully and completely trust God? Because that's what the Reformers are lifting up for us. We only earn our way into heaven. We only make our way into heaven through that complete now, Martin Luther and John Calvin were not the first to raise some of these issues. There was a man by the name of Jan Hus. And Jan Hus lived a hundred years before Luther and Calvin, and he raised a lot of these same issues in the church. And he's well known for this quote. He once said, seek the truth, listen to the truth, teach the truth, love the truth, abide by the truth, and defend the truth Unto death. Now, Jan Hus will actually take that to his death. He's burned at the stake for standing up for what he believes. And so, when we look at Martin Luther and we look at John Calvin, we have to somehow fully understand what they were doing. 
It was serious business. That when they were standing up for what they knew to be the truth, fully realizing that the stand that they were making very likely would cost them their death. And yet when Martin Luther first made these claims upon the church wide and, and pointed all kinds of different passages. Malachi read the one from Romans, but there's many more. We are made right with God, not through what we do, but only through Christ, only through clinging to the cross, clinging to the resurrection. That is our only way in to salvation. Well, Martin Luther in 1521 was called before this entire council, and he was demanded to recant what he was teaching what he was saying. The leaders were saying, you'd better recant, otherwise there will be serious repercussions. Remember, death was a very real possibility. And as Luther stood there, he said this, I am bound by the scriptures. I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not retract anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. I cannot do otherwise. Here I stand. May God help me. Amen. Here I stand. Did you catch that? Luther was caught between the humans of his day and age, the leaders of his day and age, and God's word. He had God on one side and humans on the other side. If you're put in that situation, whose side do you take? I want you to consider that. Who do you trust? Who do you believe? And who do you ultimately hold up as the absolute source of truth in this life and this world? Now this is week two of our sermon series on uh, David. And our reading that Malachi read to us a little bit ago is probably one we all know. and we, One we all love. David and Goliath. In fact, even if you're not a church-going person, you know this story. It's a great story. And I want to get a little bit of the details. What you see up here on the screen is the actual site of the battle between David and Goliath. This is called the Valley of Elah. And if you see carefully in this valley, there's essentially two different mountain ranges. And in the middle, uh, there's a valley in between. Well, the Israelites would have encamped themselves on the north Mountains and the Philistines would have encamped themselves on the southern mountains, and they stared at each other for weeks upon weeks upon weeks because neither side wanted to go down into that valley, face the consequences of being open ducks out in the open, and then have to charge back up the other side, putting themselves at a complete disadvantage. And so they dug themselves in, and weeks went by. And finally, this man named Goliath came forward from the enemy side, from the Philistine side. And Goliath, what do we know about him? Well, he's a giant. And scripture tells us Goliath stood six cubits and a span. Does anybody know what a cubit is? I'll teach you what a cubit is. Everybody put out your arm like this. Everybody stick out your arm. One cubit is the distance between your elbow and the tips of your fingers. So that is one cubit. Now, this is not a precise measurement. You know, they didn't have measuring tapes. They didn't have GPS back in biblical times. So when they measured things, they would describe it in terms of cubits. And so Goliath is described as six cubits and a span, which is essentially half of that distance. Now, I've seen Goliath's height to describe anywhere from about six foot nine on the short side all the way up to nine feet, probably depending on the length of one's arm. Right? Some of us have longer arms than others, right? Now, what would cause Goliath to be so big? And he came out and challenged these Israelites every single day. You send your best warrior to face me. We'll do solo combat. Whoever wins will go home victorious. He went out there every single morning taunting God's people with this threat. Are you scared? Are you not man enough? Do you not have anybody that will challenge me? He went out every day. And you can just picture these Israelites. And it's hard not to put ourselves in the same camp. Here's this man that stood 
seven feet, eight feet, nine feet tall, challenging the Israelites. Finally, it's the shepherd boy. It's David. For last week, we, we read that he was anointed by Samuel as the next king of Israel. He's been spiritually anointed by God the Father, but politically on the ground, nobody knows it yet. David does something that everybody else in that camp was not willing to do. He trusted God above everything else in this life. He looked to God and he realized, if I'm going to if I'm going to open my life up to anything that comes my way, I want to be on God's side. I don't know if this is going to end badly for me. probably thought it was going to end very badly for him, looking at this giant before him. But he trusted God. He believed God. He was going to follow God above any other human being in this life and in this world. And as they went before um, Goliath, he said these words. And I think they're very similar to what Martin Luther said in the 1500s. He yells out to Goliath, you come to me with sword, with spear, and with javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord's heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today, the Lord will conquer you. Did you catch that? David didn't say, today I will conquer you. He didn't say, today this army will conquer you. The Lord will. Who do you trust? Who do you follow? When you take that last breath, do you fully trust? Do you fully trust God? Now there's a few other interesting stories about this David. How does he take down the light? Do you remember the weapon of choice that he uses? It's a slingshot, right? I think most of us typically think of a child's slingshot, something small. But the slingshot that David rolled around was much more powerful. You see, God knew the plan that he was setting up. The slingshot that David swung around was long, and he was talented at this. He was able to sling these rocks and enough force that they've done studies on this. The force that David's slingshot struck Goliath is essentially the same type of force as using a 45 millimeter this was no small feat. God knew what he was doing all along. And David trusted. David believed. David put his utmost confidence in the Lord his God. This is Reformation Sunday. This is the Sunday I beg of you. Don't fall into that trap. That we think that somehow we can find ourselves somehow worthy before God, because we're not. Don't fall into the trap thinking that somehow if God just helps me out from time to time, kind of like those training wheels on a, a kid's bike, you know, sometimes we need God's help, but for the most part, I'm able to live this life in faith good enough. We're not. There is one way into heaven. And if there's one message I want you to hear from me in my time here with you, there is only one way. There is one truth. The entryway to heaven is narrow, and Jesus warns us of that. We are our way into heaven, not by the things we do, but because of Christ, because of God. And we have to have full trust. We have to have full faith in that. Today, I want you to examine your hearts. I want you to examine your souls. I want you to ask yourselves, do I trust? Do I really, really believe? And if the answer is no, I want you to dive deeper into God's word. I want you to pray. If the answer is, I think I can do it myself, friends, you've got another thing coming. Jesus came to this life to save me, to save you. Let's trust that. Let's cling to that. Let's believe that. If you believe it, can I hear an amen? Amen. amen. amen.